begin our Sunday morning Bible study. We're glad that you're with us here today. We are studying in the book of Titus, in the New Testament, Titus chapter 3, and verses 9 through 15, and I think we'll be finishing up the book of Titus this morning, at least I hope we will, and then we'll move into the book of Philemon, which is a very short book, only 25 verses long, and then we'll get started with the book of Hebrews, which is a lot longer, so... But it's good to see everybody this morning. We're glad that you're with us. Let's have a word of prayer together at this time. And would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessing of the night's rest. Thank you, Father, for this country in which we live, where we can freely assemble here this morning to worship you. Father, we're grateful for the people who are here today and we ask your blessings on each one of them. Father, we're grateful for your son, Jesus, and for the life that he lived and the death that he died so that we might have forgiveness of our sins. We pray, Father, for all of those who are suffering illness at this time. We ask, Father, whatever their need may be, that you would help them. We pray, Father, that uh, you would help us to look out for one another and help each other as we have opportunity to do that. Help us, Father, to spread your gospel to the world and especially to those around us in our lives to teach the message of your Son, Jesus, that they may have hope and joy and love and peace and salvation within their lives. Father, bless us now as we study your word together. We ask that you help us to open our hearts and minds to your will, that we would understand it, know it, and love it, and practice it within our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. Paul is now closing out his letter to Titus here. And he says in this last part, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. All right. Well, Paul told Titus to avoid certain things. Notice what he says here in verse 9. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Avoid foolish disputes. What do you think a foolish dispute is here that Paul is saying to avoid? Yes, um, those were some disputes that they had, and Paul wrote about those. He wrote about the first one in 2 Thessalonians, and then about the second one in the book of Galatians. So, and both of those issues, he corrected those who were involved in it. To the first group, he said, you don't need to get back to work. And to the second group, he said, don't make law of Moses a requirement for salvation, you know. So, any dispute that's going to contradict God's Word is a foolish dispute in the sense that it's foolish to contradict the Word of God, right? 
And in essence, that's what those two disputes were, were basing themselves on. Of course, you know, a foolish dispute is going to be anything that's going to lead to contention or division or strife or something of that nature. And so it could be a number of things. It doesn't have to be any one thing per se. But, um, you know, uh, there's been congregations where people have argued until they're blue in the face over the color of the carpet, for example. Or where they couldn't decide what color to paint the walls or something like that. That would be a foolish dispute, uh, undoubtedly. You know, that, that shouldn't be the kind of thing that, that we get upset about or that we uh, really have any worries about. Um, so there's several different categories, I guess you could say, of foolish disputes. One would be matters of opinion uh, that people are divided about. And uh, the other would be matters of doctrine where somebody, someone is contradicting the Word of God. And so, um, Paul's instruction to Titus here is designed to, uh, designed to prevent him from getting embroiled in, in silliness, you know, in, in things that have no bearing on his primary mission and his primary responsibilities of preaching and teaching the gospel. I mean, that's really what um, Paul is trying to help Titus to do. And so if he gets involved in foolish disputes, then that takes away from the work that he's supposed to be doing of preaching and teaching the gospel and helping people uh, come to the knowledge of the truth. So, he's going to tell him a little bit later on, verse 10, reject the device of man after the first and second admonition. So, there's a measure in which you want to acknowledge people, but then after a certain period of time, you're going to have to move on, more or less, is what he's saying. And um, that, of course, is going to depend on the attitude, in large part, of the people that you're dealing with as well. Notice he says, avoid foolish disputes, genealogies. There's another area. That doesn't so much affect us today. But back in the first century, when there were many Jewish Christians, who wanted to establish their uh, heritage, genealogically speaking, and say, oh, I'm, I'm a distant relative of David, you know, or I'm a distant relative of Samuel, or, you know, whoever else might be uh, famous, you know, in the history of Israel, then those genealogies could become contentious. Um, and arguing about those things doesn't serve any purpose. You know, Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 and verse uh, 28, I believe it was, that in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither male nor female, there's neither bond nor free. Um, and the point of that is that none of those physical relationships that some put a tremendous amount of value in those things don't really make a difference in Christ Jesus because we're all one. We're supposed to be all be united in Christ Jesus. So genealogies would have been an opportunity for some to create strife and troubles and divisions. And so Paul tells us, you avoid that. Don't, don't get yourself involved in those things. Contentions and strivings about the law. Contentions. Um, a contention, you know, that's going to be a sharp disagreement between people. And Titus was not to have sharp disagreements between people. He wasn't to be involved with that. Um, that. That doesn't mean that he was never to disagree with someone. And I want to emphasize that because you cannot preach and teach the gospel as a faithful 
child of God without having a disagreement with someone. But how do you handle that disagreement? That's the question. There's a right way to handle disagreements and there's a wrong way to handle disagreements. And a contention is a wrong way to handle disagreements. There's also the need to recognize the difference between a real disagreement and just a, what, what are called sometimes verbal disagreements, okay? A verbal disagreement is when you have people, two people disagreeing seemingly, but they're talking about two different things. So, for example, let's say that I watched a football game yesterday and Jimmy watched a football game yesterday and we were talking about the game and how well the team did. And Jimmy said, well, they didn't do well at all. And I said, well, what are you talking about? They did great. And Jimmy said, well, no, they didn't. And I said, wait, wait, wait a minute now. What team are you talking about? And he says, well, I'm talking about the, the red coats. And I said, well, I'm talking about the blue coats. You know, well, there's two different teams. There's not, we're not really disagreeing. We're having a, what's called a verbal disagreement. And sometimes that can happen as well when people are talking about two different things. We need to be careful. We need to really ask a lot of questions uh, when we're disagreeing with somebody and, and, you know, making sure that we're on the same page with them about what we're disagreeing about before we actually start having a disagreement. Uh, otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels. You're not really making any progress at all. So contention could be a verbal disagreement or it could be a sharp uh, disagreement where inappropriate attitudes are involved. Strivings about the law. Strivings about the law. You know, the, uh, the Mosaic Law is a... We've, we've studied through it. We've read through it here in our Wednesday night Bible study. And there's a lot of difficult things about the Mosaic Law. And I think we can just say with relative uh, peace and blessing that we are thankful that we're not under the Mosaic Law. <laughs> you know, it is a blessing to be under the freedom and liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. So, but the Mosaic Law was a legal instrument. It was a legal document. And you know how contentious legal documents can be. I mean, if you just look at our government here today and the amount of legalities that are out there, um, it can be a very contentious and difficult situation to have to struggle with the legal system. Well, the same was true uh, about the Mosaic Law. It was a legal system uh, that governed a nation. And so there were all kinds of opinions and differences and thoughts about you know, how the law should be applied and interpreted and balanced and, and all of that. And so even Jesus had difficulty with the Pharisees and the lawyers and the Sadducees uh, in regard to the Mosaic Law. So, but um, the Christian shouldn't be worrying about it. Strivings about the law. There's no reason to be involved in strivings about the law as a Christian because we're under Christ. Christ fulfilled the law and then he nailed it to the cross so that we could be free and at liberty. So the Mosaic Law is not something that we need to uh, worry about and more. Yes? That's right. That's right. And I guess it uh, testifies to the goodness and providence of God that He has all but eliminated that problem today. Huh? And uh, that's, that's truly a blessing. So I'm very thankful that, that that's the case. Um, but notice what he says. For they are unprofitable and useless. Unprofitable and useless. 
So, foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law, all of those things, unprofitable and useless. In other words, you're not going to get anything out of those things by having that discussion. And um, it's a, a waste of time, more or less, to uh, be involved in those kinds of things. That's what the word useless means. It means there's no point in, in talking about it. All right, any questions or comments about that? Verse 10, reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. A divisive person is really not interested in learning. Really not interested in growing. Really not interested in um, trying to better himself or herself. Divisive, the, the idea that Paul is talking about here is that person who wants to argue just for the sake of argument. Okay? And to disagree just for the sake of disagreement. There's nothing in the Bible that says that we have to put up with that kind of behavior. Um, now, we want to give people an opportunity to change and to grow. And so... That's why Paul is saying, you know, after the first and second admonition, reject that person because there's an opportunity for them to change and to grow if they will listen to the instruction and the teaching of Jesus Christ. But if they're going to persist in a divisive way, if they're going to persist in a contentious way or in, in a, a way that's going to cause uh, disunity, then they need to be rejected. Um, Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 18, you know, what we do if, if someone sins against us personally, we go and talk to that person, uh, and then if that doesn't do any good, we take two or three witnesses with us and talk to them again, and if that doesn't work, then you bring it before the church, you know. So, that's something that we need to practice faithfully. And Paul's instructions here to Titus uh, does not exclude that process. Jesus was talking about brothers and sisters in Christ in that particular context of Matthew 18. Here, this could be anyone, not necessarily a Christian, but anyone. And so, I'm sure that um, the church there, where Titus was at, on Crete, had all kinds of people coming and going. And if there was a divisive person there, then um, coming in, then that was an opportunity for them to hear the gospel. If they wanted to be divisive, then, I'm sorry, you know, we need, unless you want to talk about constructive matters, then I need to move on to other things. Uh, is, is basically the attitude that Paul is telling Titus to have in his preaching and teaching. Like I said earlier, nothing in the Bible says that you have to put up with a divisive, contentious person. Um, there's no obligation that a Christian has to do that. So, um, you talk to them, Give them a couple of chances, and then it's going to... And, and you're not to be rude or anything like that. That's not saying you have to be rude in this process. It's just saying that that's... Your job isn't, as a gospel preacher, your job isn't to um, constantly have to deal with contentious and divisive people from the standpoint of having to put up with them. Um, there are better things to focus on. There are better things to do. And people like that, if they're members of the church, they need to be referred to the eldership. And that's 
That's typically what I do. If I, if I find somebody who's trying to be divisive and who's trying to be contentious, then I'll just say, look, um, you know, you're welcome to go talk to the elders about this issue. It's fine with me. And uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to listen to you. you know? But that's not my job to try to manage, you know, divisive, contentious type people. Yes? Well, I, I don't think so. I think this divisive and, and contentious people, that's more of an attitude thing. Uh, it's more of the, I'm right and you're wrong and there's nothing that you're going to say is going to change my mind sort of mentality, sort of attitude, and that, that you, you're just not going to make any progress with anybody who has that kind of attitude, you know. And unless the attitude changes, then there's no discussion that's going to be worth having. Yes? Uh, I feel like a, a lot of all individuals are holding out to a for farming at some point. As long as you're, you're teaching somebody that's right, you're teaching them what's right, you're teaching them what's right, when it comes to some point, they're just not going to accept it. Not gonna, they're going to refuse to accept it as much proof as you give them, time to move to the next case. Well, that's right. I mean, you don't want to... Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. Mm -hmm. So that's... That's part of what that means, is, is not dealing with divisive people. Now, does that mean that you're not cordial or you're not polite? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Certainly, we should be honor all men, you know, uh, the Bible says. So, we want to be polite, we want to be cordial, but that doesn't mean that I have to sit there and just let be harangued, you know, um, and do nothing about it. That may be somebody's job, but it's not my job, <laughs> you know. So anyway, but that's, that's and, and I always tell people, I say, look, uh, I don't think we're going to be making any progress here today, but uh, if you would like to take it up with the elders, uh, that's fine. Or sometimes I might say to somebody, why don't you give it a few weeks and think about it and come back and we can talk about it at a later time. Sometimes, you know, when, when you have somebody like that, sometimes it's the case that they just, at the moment, they feel real emotional about the issue for whatever reason, you know. And then two or three weeks go by, those emotions settle down, and it's not nearly as important as it was, you know, two weeks ago. So sometimes that can happen also, um, and... People can be upset for whatever reason, and usually that kind of thing, you know, I, I don't know that I've ever really met maybe this but one or two absolutely divisive type people. I can think of one in my memory right now, but uh, other than that one, I don't think I've met really a lot of people who like that. Most people are very reasonable and cordial and and they, they want to, uh, you know, have peaceful relationships with other people. And, and so, but on the rare occasion when you meet somebody like that, then you're going to have to say, well, maybe, maybe we should talk about this some other time in the future and see if things have changed a little bit. So, but there's no reason to sit there and let somebody just, uh, you know, uh, harass you. Um, over something, you can move on from such situations. And in verse 11, uh, Paul talks about the real reasoning or the real problem behind a divisive person, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Um, you know, sometimes we do encounter people with bad attitudes. And it could be that somebody just had a bad day. It could be that a person was bitter, you know, for because of many years of doing things that didn't work out for them or whatever. But really, a bad attitude says more about the person 
attitude has the attitude that is not the person who's receiving the uh, unpleasantness associated with the attitude, right? And so what I try to remember is exactly what Paul says here. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinning being self-condemned. Okay, this guy's got a bad attitude. And that's his problem. It's not my problem. So I don't have to let that be transferred to me, right? I don't have to sit here and say, well, because he's being negative and unruly and disagreeable, that I have to be negative and unruly and disagreeable also. That, that's not the case. Now, a lot of people do that simply because of their, um, I don't want to say, fight or flight instincts, you know, that everybody has. Um, and so, if somebody uh, has a bad attitude and they're haranguing me, then the first thing that this uh, fallen man wants to do is to respond in kind. Well, if they're going to treat me that way, I'm going to treat them that way too. And, you know, people get into all kinds of, uh, of uh, brawls because of that kind of thinking and that kind of uh, mentality. Well, if we remember that the problem is with the other person, not with us, that will help us to maintain the right attitude toward other people when they are not having the right attitude. You know? uh, and that's what Paul is saying here. Here's a divisive man. You give them two admonitions and you send them on their way. Why? Because that, that person is the one who has the problem, not you. And that's basically what Paul is saying here. That such a person is warped in sinning, being self-condemned. Um, and, and warped, the word warped, does anybody have a different translation there besides warped or perverted? Perverted? Okay, perverted. So, and, and that, the idea you know, of what a warp is, if you have a I say a two by four with a warp in it, it's twisted, right? Or it's it's wavy, there's not much you can do with it. Um, if something is warped, it's it, it's not able to satisfy the purpose for which it was made, right? So this person, this divisive person, he's warped. He he can't act right, in other words. And what needs to be done is for him to get unwarped before you can have a conversation with him. And that, that, that might happen over time, you know. God can, God can do things that I can't do. God can make changes in people that, that I can't make in people. And so um, that's something that I, we need to let God handle. And God can certainly help somebody become unwarped if uh, they need to do that. But again, the problem is with that person, not with me, and so I shouldn't let his attitude reflect on my attitude and therefore have a bad attitude because of what this person is doing. All right, and, and really that's true, not just with divisive people, but with anyone of any age, really, who is not behaving appropriately, um, we need to sit back and we need to relax a little bit and look at the situation and, okay, how can I make this situation better, you know? And eventually, if we have that attitude toward the situation, we'll find something that will resolve whatever trouble is, is happening. Any other thoughts or comments about that? Well, the apostles themselves had some form of disputing among themselves among, who should, among them who should be the greatest. And that was a division of sorts that rose up within them. And even though Jesus taught on it, uh, even though there were things that happened, I'm sure that other people were aware of it in the course of the ministry, uh, knowing that these disciples, apostles were, were quarreling a little bit, um, they came to realize in growth, maturity, 
that they needed to adopt the principles of Christ in selflessness and love and esteem others better than themselves and so forth. But um, that was something I think that should have been an influence in the first century in seeing that change as well as uh, the example of Christ itself. But uh, see how these apostles implemented, followed that example. And uh, there were still individuals like Diotrephes that loved to have the preeminence. And they did cause problems. But um, the instructions what the apostle given here it, it helps us to get past. Uh, and like you said, not get mired down. And Peter says you can become entangled again in the pollution and corruption of the world. You need to be aware and, and stay away from it if you can. So there's, there's a lot to consider in not being divisive ourselves and trying to, actively trying to follow the example and principles of Christ. I think that's a good point, is that really this is about following Christ and doing His will within our life. And, of course, that means humbling ourselves before the Lord and uh, recognizing that uh, uh, we, we have a, a relationship with Jesus that is dominant over all other relationships. And when we let that relationship uh, shine, then nothing else is going to uh, be be able to affect us in a way that's going to cause us to get involved with some kind of sordid circumstance of one sort or another. So that's a good point. And yes, ma'am. I think one good example that we have to follow Jesus in this example, and I thought about a lesson about kids that had a few weeks on them. I threw it down my you know, the Good Samaritan. When the man asked him a question and tried to pick him up, Jesus just took him and put it back on him. Instead of arguing with him and trying to talk sense in him, he put the pressure on him to answer the question. And that worked. I mean, as far as it didn't change the man's mind, but at least there wasn't a big argument going on. And that's the way it Right. And, you know, I mean, there were times when Jesus refused to do business with other people. I mean, uh, there was one point where Jesus said, the blind follow the blind, and they'll both fall in the ditch, you know. Well, in other words, don't worry about them. Let them fall in the ditch, and you stay on the road. I mean, that's basically what his point was there. So, um, But, yeah, he, he had plenty of people to deal with and were contentious and divisive and, and all kinds of other things. And so he handled everything that correctly. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts? Acts chapter 13, even the sorcerer was seeking to pull away the, the deputy from the truth and keep, keep him in the dark, so to speak. But he, uh, he was dealt with by the Apostle Paul and identified as being full of subtlety and mischief and he would not cease to convert the right ways of the Lord. So, punitively, he was stricken blind. But, uh, as, as a matter of course, it, it's, or I guess it's a broader category looking at things, it's just a way of taking that out of the equation and proceeding on in productivity. Right. Okay. Well, let's look at verse 12 and following. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. So uh, here were two brothers who Paul could rely on to help spread the message. Um, it looks to me like Artemis or Tychicus may be the messengers by which this particular letter went. I don't know. But and Paul may have not decided which one he was going to uh, to use uh, at first, Artemis or Tychicus, and so he just used said both of them. When I said Artemis to you or, or Tychicus, Tychicus, maybe he's the one I'm going to use. Um, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. So, in other words, uh, Paul 
wanted to see Titus again, and this was the place where Paul was going to spend the winter, that is at Nicopolis. And so um, if Titus wanted to see Paul, then he had to come to Nicopolis to do that. So here are some good, faithful men who are all can count on to help him with the work of ministry. And uh, he certainly wanted to see Titus again. I'm sure Titus wanted to see Paul again. Verse 13, send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. So, uh, Zenos the lawyer and Apollos. Uh, we don't get a lot of details about what they were doing, um, but were they already in Crete working, or were they going to be passing through? At some point, um, Paul is evidently telling Titus to support their work. Zenos the lawyer and Apollos. Send them on their journey with haste that they may lack nothing. He wanted Titus to make sure they had everything they needed uh, as they were traveling through Crete. And maybe, and of course we're familiar with Apollos. Um, he was a preacher of the gospel. And uh, he knew a lot about the scriptures in the Old Testament. So Zenos, the lawyer, we don't have as much information about him. Uh, so lawyers, if, if this is the typical same word that's referred to the lawyers in Jesus' time, were individuals who were knowledgeable of the Mosaic law. Now I don't know if Zenos was a Jewish person or not. Um, the name seems to indicate that he was not, but he could have been. And or it may have been that he was just a lawyer in the Roman courts. And that would have been a handy guy to have around, you know, uh, in this particular time, especially when you were um, threatened with uh, legal action under the Roman Empire, which Paul was many times in preaching and teaching the gospel as well as uh, some others, no doubt. The world. But they were doing good work, evidently, Zenos the lawyer and Apollos, and Paul wanted okay. Titus to support that good work. You know, occasionally we have opportunity for people to come through and, and who need assistance with various things who are working in the Lord's uh, work. And uh, I want to commend this congregation for, for following Paul's advice here, you know, when people come through doing good work, let's hear what the work is, let's support the work, let's do the best that we can, you know, to help them out. We have, we have the opportunity to help them, we have the means to help them. And um, that's exactly what Paul's advice to Titus was, to make sure that they had the resources they needed to continue to do the good work they were doing. And so he just said, you know, send them on their way with haste that they may lack nothing. So that they can get back to doing the job that they were called by God to do. And I think that's a, a great uh, example of application sometimes to uh, things that we talk about in reference to helping uh, preachers and teachers of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Verse 14, And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Um, and this is associated, of course, with verse 13. This is the principle that Paul is applying in verse 13. And that is, the, the principle in verse 14 is, we've got to maintain good works. And these good works can be a number of different things. Uh, and to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Um, the church, we don't want the church to be unfruitful. We don't want the church to die on the vine, so to speak. And how do we prevent that from happening? We've got to maintain good works. And so, if we're not maintaining good works, and, and I'm not talking about things that I want to do personally, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a lot of things. It could be
could be a, a lot of different things. But if we don't maintain good works, then we're not doing what the Lord wants us to do. We are to maintain good works, meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. We want to be fruitful in the Lord's kingdom. And to do that, we've got to maintain good works and to meet urgent needs. Any questions about that or comments? Alright, verse 15. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Um, so Paul evidently had some folks with him while he was writing this letter. Artemis and Tychicus may have been at least two of those folks who were with him. And so um, Titus would have known who was with Paul and who was greeting him. And so he says that. And then he says, greet those who love us in the faith. Um, I don't think Paul is trying to exclude anybody here by saying this. I think he's just simply saying that those who love us because of the Christian faith, you know, and that would be all Christians, and uh, therefore to greet them as well. He's just trying to cover everyone with this statement. I don't think he's necessarily saying, well, don't greet those who don't love us, you know, or something like that. That's not what he's trying to get at here. Um, grace be with you all. Amen. That's a very common close to a letter. And so, um, any questions or comments about the book of Titus at this point? All right, well, next week we'll pick up with the book of Philemon, and uh, we'll get started on that. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning.